Did you know that whales help change climate? Or that coral reefs are the rainforests of the sea? And that tiny plankton in our oceans produce half the oxygen we breathe? The natural world is far more complex and profound than we ever could have imagined. And scientists are only starting to get a grip on the astounding interconnectedness of everything on Earth. From the smallest creatures to the largest, to the chemistry between the ocean and the sky. I want to explore how nature is changing in our time and how the interactions of all living beings are central to the healthy functioning of our planet. There's something so life-affirming about a walk on the beach, to be out in the elements, in such a dynamic environment. And there's a real diversity of life at these intersections of land, sea and sky. Here at Kilcool in County Wicklow, there's a wonderful mix of coastal salt marsh, tidal channels, reed beds and shingle beaches special habitats for all kinds of creatures, particularly in the summer months. Buried in beneath this mud is something completely invisible. Microscopic algae that live in among the sand here. And it's those microscopic algae that transform the sun's energy into something that's edible and that's eaten by all sorts of tiny little invertebrates that then are the food for all the bivalves, the different shells that we find here in the mud as well. This is all full of filter feeders and that's the basis of the whole food chain that makes this ecosystem so, so rich and so full of bird life. And there's something quite rare that makes its home here on the beach every summer. So now you've brought us out here to Tilku Beach. What is going on here? Uh, well, we're here in the middle of the breeding season of the Little Turn, which is uh, Ireland's rarest breeding seabird. And at Kilcool here, we've got a project set up to conserve them to ensure that their breeding goes as successfully as possible each year. And why is it that Kilcool Beach here is so special for the terns? Well, uh, on the east coast, we've got a very long stretch of shingle beach running for 15 kilometres from Greystones to Wicklow Town. Uh, and the shingle provides good camouflage for the eggs, really good warmth for the eggs as well too, so it's good for incubating them. But this particular stretch here at Kilcool is really attractive to the terns because of the estuary and the lagoon that's located behind the shingle beach. And it looks like there's quite a lot of them here. There's more than 100? Or... Yeah, so uh, this year, 2015, we've actually recorded the highest number of breeding pairs on record for little terns at Kilcool. So when the project began back in the mid-80s, there was a mere 20 pairs because they were being affected by disturbance from people on the beach. So you've got quite an elaborate fence here, and this is just up through the, the breeding season for the little terns. Yes, this section of fencing uh, here in the middle of the beach is kind of uh, cordoning off the main area where the terns actually lay their eggs and have their small chicks. That's fantastic. So what we had was is very, very low numbers of this really rare bird, and now through these fences and the wardens, the, the population is starting to recover a bit. Yeah, it's, it's really just an example of sometimes all you need to do is give nature a bit of space and a bit of time off from uh, the day-to-day, -day, you know, manic behaviour that humans can often uh, you know, impose on them, uh, whether through disturbance or actually direct effects. And then when they're finished uh, breeding, what, what, where do they go then? So from now on in, what we're going to start seeing is we're going to start seeing flocks of terns uh, occupying uh, the area along the foreshore of both juveniles that can fly and adults. So they'll be gone by mid-August and they probably get to Africa by about mid-October or so. 
It's amazing that something so little and kind of delicate is making that trip all the way to Africa for the winter and then coming all the way back here next spring to breed again. Yeah, I mean, like, the, these birds aren't really that big at all. Like, uh, the adults probably weigh only somewhere in the region of about 60 grams. You got loads! Oh, so these are... Uh, these are our little, these are our charges for the season. These are the juvenile little terns that we've been working so hard to protect. So you can see on the bird's legs yeah. that there's two types of rings that these birds are being fitted with. And these are both in, unique to this bird. Okay. So if anybody sees this bird again, whether take a photograph of it or see it with a telescope at this colony or another, or somewhere on their migration route, and they let us know where it's been, we're able to track that bird's movements. created a little bit of, of habitat in here for yeah, them. Yes, so this is, uh, we, we can maybe put the smallest chick into here. So 47.65 grams, yeah. So that's nearly, nearly fully grown. So every day, chicks are uh, gathered up on the beach and they're weighed and they're measured. And that uh, information is plotted uh, individually and throughout the whole uh, colony as well too. So we can look at the sort of average growth rate of the chicks and that's coupled then with kind of the information gathered from feeding studies by looking at the number of fish and types of fish that have been brought in to feed the chicks by the parents. And that can be used as sort of like a, a sort of a snapshot piece of information to get a, an idea of how the ecosystem is functioning here. Because, you know, in a year when there's lots of fish, the chicks will be fed well, the growth rate, rates will be fine. So we haven't seen any information this year to suggest a, a bad breeding season or a bad feeding season. It's amazing to think that there's a warden working here 24-7 to ensure the safety of the hatchling terns during the breeding season. Something that just happened naturally for thousands of years. According to some predictions, we're going to see more storms, more frequent, more severe storms with climate change. Is that a concern? Absolutely, yes. It's one of the main concerns that we'd actually have for this particular colony here at Kilkul. Um, the beach has been narrowing over the years, and this is just from chatting to the, to the members of the public that come down here and have been coming down here for years. They could, they've told me that, you know, ever since the 80s, they've noticed that the beach is getting narrower and narrower. Uh, so that obviously reduces the area that the terns are able to nest on. In 2012, we actually had no uh, recorded hatching or fledging for the first time on record. Uh, so whilst it happens every few years, you get a little bit of it, a few nests might go out to sea. Uh, terns can deal with that, but it's the big events like in 2012 that we're afraid might actually happen again and again and get more prevalent as we see some changes in, in our weather patterns. The increasing vulnerability of the terns is a pattern that's repeated in the struggle of other species whose habitats have been changing rapidly. Since prehistoric times, salmon have had a special place in Irish culture as a sacred animal. This iconic species has been in decline here for the last few decades. At the Marine Institute in County Mayo, they're studying the migration patterns of salmon from distant oceans to their spawning grounds in the rivers in the hope that they can discover some reasons why the salmon aren't returning from sea. So we've two different types of salmon here. It's the wild fish that have been coming back for eons, and then there's a hatchery, yes? There's a hatchery group of fish which we use here to monitor the performance, if you like, of wild fish. That generation of fish then, when they're grown from the eggs, will be sent to sea, and each one of those fish will be tagged with a, with a code, a batch-coded tag. They will go to sea, and they will return over a year later, but we will know how many we released and how many have returned. That gives us a very precise estimate of the marine survival of these hatchery fish. Okay. And that's a good surrogate then for what's happening with the wild stock. Currently, we know that the return rates for hatchery fish are in and around two, three percent, but for wild fish, they're maybe around six percent. Now, that's actually quite low. That rate of return has gone down nearly three times 
in the last decade and a half or two decades, That's since the 19th. A massive fall. So only three Absolutely. in every hundred fish are actually coming back from sea and the rest are, are, are dying at sea. That's exactly right. And do we know why? A lot of it can be associated with changes in the environment. We know the seas are warming and we know there's a direct link for some stocks between growth and survival and we know there's a direct link between survival and temperature at this stage. It's really alarming. Absolutely. Are we going to get to see some Absolutely. of the ones that then That's have we'll actually do. survived and managed to make yep. it all the way back again? I'm going to show you some of the fish that have been out to the ocean, probably as far as the Norwegian Sea, probably in and around the Faroe Islands and have come back again. These are the survivors. Going to be catching some fish. Yeah, I've been here for you. Excellent. Is it ready? Will I, will yeah, I jump yeah, in and see what you see? Up. Try my hand, OK. Yeah. It's like a hand there, aren't you? Uh, I think I will manage. Thank you. As part of the research undertaken at the Marine Institute, Dr. Katie Thomas takes samples of salmon scales. These give valuable clues to the environmental factors affecting marine growth, survival and migration. Yeah, we'll have a look now. I have taken a few pictures already, ready to show you. So we'll just go inside here and have a look. And Katie, these are, these are the scales prepared in this slide. Yeah, they are. These are Galway salmon. Uh, these would be one sea winter salmon, so they've been to sea for one winter. You can actually kind of see the darkening there, so that's, that's where your, your winter is. And then what we do is use the microscope, take a picture, and this is what we, we then get. And from this, we get all our measurements. Wow, it looks um, just like a, a slice of a tree. It's like it a is, it is kind of the same concept. It's concentric rings. Uh, they're actually called circuli. Um, so you can see here is the freshwater stage and then after this all marine growth. So we can actually break it down to weekly growth, two weekly growth, monthly and we can then compare that between rivers, populations and even decades. So we can kind of track if there's been any changes in growth over time. This matters because there's been a decline since the 70s. And from us being able to see scales prior to the 70s and post 70s, we can actually see has there been in certain months, has there is there a trend of, of decreased growth? And this is how you're telling then about the, the, a lot of the, the salmon that aren't returning from sea is yeah. because they're, they're not nourished properly. This, yeah. this is how you're telling that. We would see an, in certain years, is there any anything that's indicating any problems out there? If there's not much growth, if there's little distance between these circuli, we can see that obviously the environment isn't as it should be, maybe food isn't there, temperatures have changed. And there's one other thing that is becoming apparent, it's a growth check that is happening around here in the last decade, and we're actually trying to understand what is, what is causing that now at this stage. So that really keys into the last few decades of, of this decline, so. I never would have thought that a fish scale has so much detailed information. Yeah, so much. It's, it's the whole life history is encapsulated into it, and from that we can interpret exactly what, what is happening to, to those fish. I wanted to find out more about the changing migration patterns of our salmon and also see them in their natural habitat. Nearby Loch Fia is a gathering place for the salmon before they leave their life at sea to return to the spawning streams. The open sea is actually just around the corner from us here and if you sniff very hard, you can actually smell the salt because what happens is when the tide pushes in, you get full salt water just around the corner. So we're in the real transition zone here. So the fish are just moving in from the salt water into fresh water. And what they're really doing is they're trying to sense now the location where their spawning grounds are. And once they get the first big rains of autumn, then they'll move straight upstream and up towards their spawning grounds. And then they'll be going right up I was dying to see the salmon leaping out of the water and no better guide than Ken, who knows this area like the back of his hand. Well, this is a good spot here. Yeah, just along, just along this, this rocky shoreline here. I saw something jump there a little few minutes ago. Well, you see them both jump out of the water and then also you see fish just, you just see backs and just see them come out and just swim along uh, the surface as such. There tends to be a very large concentration of fish here, just waiting for the water to come down from the little stream just behind us. So this area here is quite a good area to spot them. The salmon weren't happy to perform for us on the day, but Ken gave me some background on the conclusions scientists are drawing regarding their fate. 
we had a huge collection of information about what was happening in the freshwater phase, but nobody was looking as to what was happening at sea. And people over time realised that in reality there was a real problem at sea, a serious problem at sea. So we needed to get out there and we needed to find out what was happening. When it was looked at in the round, what we found was, in essence, it's to do with climate change and the changes in the ocean. And basically the ocean is getting warmer. As a result of the ocean getting warmer, it has changed the actual structure, the feeding structure of the small organisms that the salmon are feeding on at sea and then the larger organisms that are feeding on those. So the salmon is attempting to adapt. The big question, the big unknown is, will the salmon have time to adapt and to be able to get used to the new patterns that there are at sea? So the salmon is actually really an aquatic canary. It's a very good indicator species as to how these layers of the ocean are actually changing. And it's indicating not alone is the food changing for the salmon, but the food is changing for the mackerel, food is changing for the herring. It's amazing to think that such tiny changes in the ocean temperature can upset the balance of the food chain and alter the migration patterns of salmon. Changes in our oceans are having impacts on all marine species. Killary Harbour is a natural fjord fed by the Atlantic Ocean. It's ideally suited to mussel farming, which began here in the 1980s and is now one of the main industries relied on by the local community. I went there to meet local mussel farmer Simon Kennedy and Dr Evan McGovern, who's a senior chemist at the Marine Institute. So many forms of food production have negative impacts on the environment. But mussel farming can be sustainable. Mussels are bivalves, filter feeders that consume phytoplankton, which comes in with the tide twice a day when the ocean feeds the harbour with a fresh influx of seawater. Wow, there's a lot of mussels on those ropes. Yes. 100, 150% too much, probably. So you'll have and, to thin uh, so, them out. So these lot have to be thinned out, yeah. Shellfish both rely on the pristine seawater for food, and in turn, they further purify it. Seeing the healthy mussels here, it's hard to imagine that they're facing a danger. New research is uncovering fundamental changes in the delicate balance of the ocean's chemistry. Beautiful place here at Killary Harbour. You wouldn't think there might be issues which we can be changing the seas, but there are because our concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have increased since the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Now, that would actually be even worse for the amount of carbon we have spewed into the atmosphere had not the oceans taken up about a quarter of that carbon dioxide. Wow, so the oceans actually are absorbing carbon dioxide they from the atmosphere. absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, everybody thought this was a great thing because it was ameliorating climate change, keeping the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels a little lower. But in fact, really only the last 15 years or so, we have come to realise that we are actually changing the chemistry of the oceans in quite a fundamental way. So the pH is dropping and this process is known as ocean acidification. So we know that quite simply that if you put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you will get more taken up by the ocean. So we're talking about, well, there's quite a significant change to, uh, to the ocean chemistry. Uh, mussels we have here, as we change the water chemistry, they will find it harder to make their shells. And is ocean acidification reversible? Ah, absolutely not. <laughs> not in any practical way. So once it's happened, it's happened. We pump CO2 up into the atmosphere, it'll eventually be taken up by the oceans. They overturn, so they will draw it down into the deeper oceans. That's not going to change over any uh, practical timescales which are relevant to you and me. It 
it's sobering to think that our emissions from burning fossil fuels are triggering such enormous and rapid changes to intricate chemical and biological processes in the ocean. And there's a lot of very complex webs of life in the oceans. And these have an impact on life on land as well. And when we make these changes, whether it's ocean temperature or ocean acidity, the impacts to us are really far-reaching. A huge amount of research is needed to come to grips with the full implications of our changing atmosphere. Measuring and monitoring the pH level of the ocean is undertaken out at sea along with other important research by Irish scientists studying marine ecosystems. In 1997, a major deepwater coral reef province was discovered in the Porcupine Basin off the coast of Ireland. It's a cold water reef with just as much diversity as tropical coral and reefs 350 metres high, half the height of Crocpatrick. Coral reefs are one of the most productive ecosystems on Earth, supporting 25% of all known marine species. In fact, the branch or mound that we call a coral is actually made up of thousands of tiny animals called polyps, which use the calcium and bicarbonate ions from seawater to build hard, cup-shaped skeletons, which form calcium carbonate structures. Tropical reefs in warmer climates are facing huge challenges. Coral reefs are in decline enormously around the world. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely, yeah. In terms of climate change effects, um, what's happening is coral bleaching. And this is when the corals become heat stressed. When the corals are stressed, they actually tend to kick out the algae that they actually depend on for, for food. So this means over time that the corals themselves are becoming malnourished and this is increasing the susceptibility to disease and eventually they will die. And uh, there's ocean acidification. Um, the latest uh, research indicates that as well as decreasing the potential growth rates of, of the corals themselves, that it can also weaken the dead coral that's at the base of the coral reef structure. And if that happens, that could destabilize the whole reef and then the reefs over time could disappear. Coral depend on plankton for food. Plankton are microscopic organisms, algae, tiny plants and animals that float freely within the ocean currents. Plankton are the basis of the food chain that sustains all marine life. And whales and plankton have a very special relationship. As whales swim to the top of the oceans, they release faecal plumes, or whale poo, near the surface, which stimulates the growth of plant plankton, providing food for fish like mackerel and krill, which other whales feed on. So more whales means more whale poo, more plankton and more fish. This is one of the most thrilling scientific discoveries in recent history, and it's called a trophic cascade. It's an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. But that's not the end of the story. Plankton, by photosynthesis, suck carbon out of the atmosphere and then sink to the ocean floor, locking away vast amounts of carbon long term. This is a huge impact on the whole marine ecosystem and on our atmosphere. So whales help sustain the entire living system. The recent Paris Agreement has given us a global mandate. So if we work fast to reduce emissions and give nature space to recover, there's still a strong chance we can avert the worst effects of climate change. So what are we waiting for?